Aaron, in closing, uh, I wanted to ask you about an issue that I wanted to ask you about some of the language that's being used by you and others. And, you know, I've always been reluctant to use the language of genocide because it's, it's so exploited by our government to demonize official enemies uh, and, uh, and authorize sanctions when the case for genocide isn't really clear. Um, but in this case, it really does appear to me to be a genocidal attempt to finish the job that Israel started in 1948. But there's other language that's being thrown around and is first thrown around initially by Zionists and supporters of Israel. And they put the Holocaust into play and call all their opponents Nazis. Um, Gilad Erdan, the United Nations ambassador for Israel, donned a Star of David during a general assembly proceedings with never again written on it really dis sickening cynical display as israel was butchering families in their homes in gaza but claiming that the un was some kind of nazi entity and that they wanted to see jews exterminated he actually was denounced by yad vashem the holocaust memorial museum in jerusalem hmm. and uh, by danny dayan who's a settler leader in the west bank said that you were he was abusing the memory of the holocaust but aaron uh you have referred to israel on this stream and on twitter as a, a nazi state or engaged in nazi activities and i wanted you to explain why you're using that language well i mean nothing to me can compare with the crimes of the nazis that was uh unprecedented industrial scale mass extermination. And so, you know, no two atrocities are the same. But what is Nazism? It's a belief in your complete supremacy. It's a complete dehumanization of the people you're trying to wipe out. And you're driven by this chauvinism, by the supremacy. And in furtherance of it, you're willing to exterminate innocent people um, in large numbers. And in the case of Israel, confine them to a the largest concentration camp in history. That those, those are the words of Baruch Kimmerling, the late uh, Israeli sociologist, well known in Israel. So, how can I not compare them to Nazis and equate them to Nazis when, if you look at today in this world, who is committing crimes in the name of supremacy? Uh, it, you know, openly dehumanizing the people you're wiping out, referring to them as animals, um, making no distinction between the Palestinian civilians and the Hamas leadership, um, the, all this is Nazi rhetoric. It's uh, the crime in terms of uh, sheer numbers, of course, is not on that scale. But the underlying attitude of, of just wanton disregard for human life, contempt actually, for, not, not just disregard, contempt for human life, because that's what drives Zionism. It's contempt for the indigenous Palestinian population, wanting to eliminate them. And yes, um, Israel's done that not with complete mass extermination as the Nazis were trying to do, but with massive ethnic cleansing, driving Palestinians off of their land after so many years of peaceful coexistence before that, before 1948. So I think it's a totally fair comparison, um, especially because they're getting away with it and it needs to be called out. And especially because they're trying to adopt the memory of the Nazi Holocaust, as we saw with that Israeli envoy wearing the yellow star. So in that context, I think it's totally appropriate to call them for what they are, which is a, a modern day Nazi state. Well, a Holocaust is a giant conflagration and it was a term adopted for the Jewish genocide in World War II. It was a genocide that did not only involve Jews. People were killed for being Russian, for being Roma yeah. and so on. But the term Holocaust was sort of adopted as a way of marketing the reality of Jewish persecution and extermination during World War II. And looking at Gaza, I see what took place in World War II as a Holocaust, not the Holocaust, right. because this is another Holocaust. And you can say that it's part of a wider Holocaust of Palestinians, because it's clear to me that the intention of the self-proclaimed Jewish state, which is not... Jewish in my understanding of it, but 
self-proclaimed yeah. is genocide. It does not want any accommodation with Palestinians. And now it's going for the goal of finishing 48. And it's, we're witnessing a Holocaust of bullets, of missiles, of white phosphorus, of drones. And having been under those missiles and bombs for a few nights in Gaza, I'm telling you, none of you can imagine what it's like, what they're going through. None of you can imagine the sheer terror of what it's like to spend all night wondering if the roof is going to come down on your head while bombs just explode all over you while naval ships are right off the shore that you can see shelling your city. A drone is over your head. You hear screaming, windows are breaking, and then you wake up and pull your neighbors out of the rubble. None of you can imagine what it's like. And so on the concept of, you know, on this idea of a, the term Nazi, I mean, I think it also... I think what, what a lot of Israelis are doing is reenacting the Holocaust spiritually uh, through this assault on Gaza. They have had it drilled in their minds that if they give up one, first of all, you're taught constantly about the Holocaust in Israeli public education. Uh, a large percentage of Israeli youth are sent to Auschwitz on free trips uh, by the education ministry to prepare them for army service. And they're terrified into thinking that genocide will be committed against them unless they participate in the military and they act with complete ruthlessness against Palestinians or Lebanese people or Iranians. And that helps produce a genocidal mentality. The education ministry finds that Israeli youth are more tolerant and peace-oriented and distrustful of the military before they go on these trips to Auschwitz than after. So they've inverted the lessons of the Holocaust from never again to anyone to never again to us to produce the most militarized society on the planet, which if you look at Israeli attitudes, uh, polls of Israeli attitudes among the youth are com comprehensively racist towards Arabs and even a a Palestinian citizens of Israel. Then this is this, this idea of uh, just following orders that's sort of a Nazi idea to me. The, the inability to think outside of the collective and the idea that anyone who thinks differently or is a critic is a wicked son. The leftists, the anti-war people, I know those these scattered, isolated forces in Israel right now, they're all laying low. They're afraid to go out in public. They're afraid to come on this stream. They're afraid to speak up. I'm communicating with them quietly, but they are targets. And their homes, I mean, the homes of those who have spoken out have been attacked by right-wing mobs. Um, but there's one person who I wrote about in my book, Goliath, who is sort of a moral beacon for me from within Jewish-Israeli society. He is a, a long-dead Jewish-Israeli philosopher who is one of the first critics, open critics of the Israeli military. His name, he's an Orthodox Jewish philosopher. Uh, named Yeshayahu Leibovitch, L-E-I-B-O-W-I-T-Z, or you could spell it V-I-T-Z. You can look up his videos. I really recommend reading his writing. Um, he's someone who had enormous cachet within Jewish-Israeli society, and he used that cachet to start urging young people to refuse military service, lest they become, in his term, in his words, a Judeo Nazi. And I want to play some video of him that where he lays out his argument in public in Israel about what a Judeo Nazi is. And this is an Orthodox Jewish philosopher of Israel, Yeshayahu Leibovitch. in this documentary about him produced by Israeli filmmaker A. Bon. Sorry, this is in Haifa. You can see he's popular among a certain segment of society. I'm literally overwhelmed by requests from people who turn to me some want to see me, some telephone or write. 
I'm not exaggerating when I say that I'm overwhelmed. You can hardly say what I say has no impact here. One of the subjects that people raise most frequently when they come to see me and they come of their own accord, one of the subjects they raise is that of refusing to serve. They come to talk to me about it in their dozens, I would say in their hundreds. They know, they have discovered, but who doesn't know today? The entire world knows. From Australia to Norway, that we use torture territories. Torture, we use it by virtue of the authorization given by the monster who only three years ago was president of the Supreme Court of the state of Israel. Some who in practice are more important than the president or the prime minister, that's true, and who deliberately legalized the use of torture in order to make Arab prisoners talk. That's what I mean by Judeo-Nazi. Yes, Lando. He was the one who legalized the use of torture with moderate physical force. And here's Leibovitch. In other words, there are Judeo-Nazis. Judeo-Nazis exist. Does it shock you? I'm not shocked, I'm making an observation. If I raise my voice, it's because some people still don't know. That's why I shout it out loud. Judeo-Nazis do exist. So that was Yeshai Hulebovich from another time. Um, and I think he describes a very real phenomenon that is unfortunately more present than ever. And he... Uh, it's very, it's, it's well worth reading him. Um, what he predicted, he predicted before he died, before the siege of Gaza, before the second intifada, that Israel will erect concentration camps and will become so morally depraved that it will eventually commit political suicide. That is Gaza. Gaza. 